Welcome back to another episode of A Guide to Australian Spiders. Last episode, we took a quick look at where spiders sit in the tree of life, and familiarised ourselves with the concepts of taxonomy and especially phylogeny, which are very important fields when it comes to classifying living things and understanding their relationships. This time, we'll be looking at the external anatomy of a spider, and the particular features that define them. This is by no means going to be a complete coverage of a spider's anatomical features, but I've tried to ensure that most of the prominent aspects of their anatomy are mentioned. With almost 50,000 described species, distributed throughout almost every habitat on land, it's hardly a surprise that spiders vary enormously in appearance. Yet in spite of their almost mind-boggling diversity, they are all modified versions of a shared basic body plan. As we mentioned in the previous episode of the guide, spiders belong to a clade called the Chelicerata, and as you'd expect, the basic chelicerate body plan is very much apparent in spiders. Alike to other chelicerates, a spider's body is divided into two tagmata. Tagmata, or tagma in the singular sense, are specialised regions of an arthropod's body, each consisting of multiple body segments that together form distinctive sections. In chelicerates, the two tagmata are the prosoma and opisthosoma. The prefixes pro and opistho mean front and rear respectively, the suffix soma means body. So in essence the prosoma is the front body, and the opistosoma is the rear body, which is handy for remembering their relative positions. In spiders these two tagmata are very clearly defined. The prosoma and opistosoma are often referred to as the cephalothorax and abdomen respectively. I've called them that myself a number of times. After all, abdomen fits much better into a casual, everyday conversation than opistosoma. Don't ask me why so many of my casual, everyday conversations happen to involve spiders, by the way. Anyway, these common alternatives are not without issues. The term cephalothorax implies the structure consists of a fused head and thorax. However, no evidence exists that would suggest spiders or other chelicerates ever possessed a thorax at any point in their evolutionary history. Abdomen too is problematic in the case of spiders, as a spider's opistosoma contains organs such as the heart and respiratory organs, which are not normally present in an abdomen. With that in mind, it's pretty likely that for simplicity's sake I'll still use the term abdomen from time to time. I guess, just like when I refer to a centipede envenomation as a bite when it technically isn't, sometimes I get too lazy to use the correct terminology all the time. The opistosoma bears multiple pairs of apodemes. These are ingrowths of the cuticle that provide attachment points for muscles and support for internal organs. Externally, they are visible as small, shallow dimples. Between the prosoma and opistosoma is a feature called a pedicel. This small, narrow, flexible structure occurs in all spiders and is exclusive to spiders, making it highly useful for identification purposes, as its presence is a foolproof indicator of a spider. The pedicel allows for the opistosoma to be swiveled around independently of the prosoma which is very handy for webbing as the spider need not constantly move its entire body around in order to do so. Another chelicerate trait I covered in the previous video is the number of appendages. Spiders, like all chelicerates, possess six pairs of appendages. The foremost are the chelicerae, which in spiders each bear a venomous fang, a unique characteristic exclusive to spiders not present in any other chelicerates. A spider's fangs are hinged, and when not in use are folded into a shallow groove running along the chelicerae, known as the chelicerol furrow. Behind the chelicerae are the pedipalps, 
Among spiders, pedipalps can vary greatly in size. In some cases, they are large enough to be mistaken for an extra pair of legs. In others, they are barely noticeable. Pedipalps serve a variety of functions for spiders, especially ones pertaining to courtship and mating. Male spiders use them to hold sperm. They'll uh, jack off onto a special web called a sperm web, which serves a function that's fully explained by its name. The sperm is then absorbed into the swollen tips of the pedipalps. These, known as palpal bulbs, are only fully developed in mature male spiders, and give the animal the appearance of wearing a pair of boxing gloves. But of course, these boxing gloves aren't for smashing opponents in a ring, they're for smashing the ladies. Pedipalps also serve some more miscellaneous functions as well. Both sexes will use them to feel around, hold onto prey, and even provide leverage when walking, which is especially noticeable in spiders like orb weavers, which are often rather clumsy outside of their webs and need all the help they can get to move around. Behind the pedipalps are four pairs of legs, numbered one to four, starting from the front. The main function of the legs is, of course, walking. However, many spiders possess one or more pairs of legs that are modified to serve additional, more specialised functions. For instance, some tarantula species, such as this Selenotypus plumipes, have noticeably thickened rear legs used for moving substrate around when burrowing. In crab spiders, the front two leg pairs have been greatly enlarged and are used to seize unsuspecting prey items. Regardless of size and function, all spider legs are divided into the same distinct sections. These being the coxa, trochanter, femur, patella, tibia, metatarsus and tarsus. This applies to a spider's pedipalps too, albeit with a couple noteworthy exceptions. First of all, the metatarsus is not present in the pedipalps. In addition to this, the coxa has been heavily modified, forming a structure called the maxilla, also known as the nathocoxa or endite, which is used in feeding. It's also worth noting that arthropods from the clade mandibulata, which includes insects, crustaceans, centipedes and millipedes, also possess a feeding-related structure called a maxilla. However, while they share a name and a similar function, they are not the same thing. Much of a spider's body is covered in hair-like structures of varying size. The smaller ones are known as setae, while the larger, thicker ones are called spines. Like all arthropods, spiders possess a hard external skeleton, an exoskeleton or cuticle. The exoskeleton provides protection against predators and environmental hazards, as well as supporting the animal's weight and helping it retain moisture. Muscles are attached to the exoskeleton's inner surface, similar to how they are attached to the exterior of our skeletons. Well, similar and yet basically the exact opposite at the same time. That makes sense, I'm sure. While this tough cuticle undoubtedly provides a suite of benefits for the animal, there is one very notable drawback. Not being made of any sort of living tissue, it cannot grow with the animal's body meaning it has to be shed periodically via a process known as ecdysis. Ecdysis, informally known as molting, is a process that involves multiple stages which I'll quickly go over now. Ordinarily, an arthropod's cuticle, consisting of three layers, the endocuticle, exocuticle and epicuticle, sits on top of the epidermis, which is the animal's outermost layer of skin. As the animal approaches ecdysis, the old cuticle separates from the epidermis, which secretes a new epicuticle. The original endocuticle then begins to dissolve, while a new exocuticle forms beneath the new epicuticle. Then ecdysis commences. Following ecdysis is the rapid expansion of the animal's body, in which the new cuticle is stretched and unfolded. Finally, a new endocuticle is secreted, finishing the cycle. An arthropod's behaviour will often change in the days leading up to and following ecdysis. Not least because the molting procedure leaves the animal very vulnerable. 
As it approaches ecdysis, it will typically lose interest in feeding and seek out a sheltered location in which to undergo the molting process. It will remain in this shelter until its new exoskeleton has hardened, after which the animal will return to normal behaviour. Like any decent set of armour, an arthropod's cuticle isn't exactly a one-piece outfit. Otherwise, there'd be some serious constraints on the animal's movement. And by serious constraints, I mean probably not being able to move at all. The exoskeleton consists of numerous plates known as sclerites, which may be connected by flexible joints, allowing for the animal to be sufficiently mobile in spite of its rigid armour. The dorsal surface of a spider's prosoma is covered by a large sclerite called the carapace, the shape of which is often an important feature for distinguishing different types of spiders. Located roughly around the centre of the carapace, often more toward the rear, is a small shallow depression called a fovea, sometimes referred to as a thoracic furrow or dorsal groove. This marks an apodeme, alike to the ones situated on the opisthosoma. In front of the fovea is the head region or caput, which bears the animal's eyes and is often raised above the rest of the carapace. Perhaps one of the clearest examples of this is present in spiders from the genus Michelina, which possess a very distinctively elevated caput. The caput is surrounded by a faint U or V-shaped groove called the cervical groove. The eyes are located toward the front of the caput. I mean, it's not like it'd make sense for them to be anywhere else. While some have six, the vast majority of spiders possess eight eyes. Eye arrangement can vary enormously, and it's one of the most important traits when it comes to spider identification. Yet, in almost all instances, it's usually easy enough to make out two distinct rows, each with four eyes. The eyes in the foremost row are known as anterior eyes, while those in the rearmost are called posterior. The eyes situated toward the centre are called median eyes, while those at peripheral locations are known as lateral eyes. Hence, there are four eye types, posterior lateral, posterior median, anterior lateral, and anterior median. Now let's take a look at a spider's underside, or ventral surface. One of the most prominent features here is the sternum, which is a large sclerite. Situated in front of the sternum and between the maxillae is a smaller sclerite known as the labium. Also clearly visible from beneath are a spider's book lungs, which are their means of breathing. As shown in this cross-section, book lungs consist of a stack of tissue that resembles the pages of a book, hence their name. The tissue is filled with hemolymph, the arthropod equivalent for blood, and the deep folds in the tissue greatly increase the surface area of the structure, allowing more gas to be exchanged with the environment. Each book lung is stored within a cavity called an atrium, which air enters and exits via a narrow slit. Most spiders possess only a single pair of book lungs, although more primitive spiders like trapdoors, funnel webs and tarantulas possess two pairs. Near the book lungs is a long curved groove called the epigastric furrow, at which the openings to the book lungs are located. But for spiders with two pairs of book lungs, only the foremost pair open at the epigastric furrow. The genital opening, or gonopore, is situated within this furrow. If a spider is a female, then an epigyne, or epigynum, may be seen, situated between the book lungs. This is the female's reproductive structure, and is only fully developed and clearly visible in mature spiders. Finally, we have the spinnerets, the secret to the spider's success. Well, one of them, and not really a secret either, seeing as everyone knows about them. Most spiders have six spinnerets, although there are exceptions. At the tip of each spinneret is one, or more often significantly more than one, spigot, the structures from which silk emerges. Now, while it is not directly related to anatomy, I have also decided to include a section on how we measure the size of a spider. 
Here in Australia, it seems that the standard way to measure a spider is to multiply the estimated size by about three, and if it still doesn't seem big enough to scare foreigners, then double it. Or just say it's the size of a dinner plate and call it a day. Jokes aside, there are multiple ways to measure a spider, each with their own benefits and drawbacks. The first and probably most familiar is diagonal leg span, often abbreviated as DLS. Here the measurement is made from the tip of the first leg on one side of the spider to the tip of the fourth leg on the other. It is generally used for spiders with legs that are all of roughly similar lengths, such as tarantulas. Another leg span measurement is horizontal leg span, which may be a more favourable option for spiders with legs of significantly different lengths, such as huntsmen or crab spiders. Horizontal leg span is generally measured across the longest pair of legs, from the tip of one leg to the tip of the corresponding leg on the other side. Leg span measurements are all very well, but they aren't exactly consistent. Spiders, after all, don't hold their legs in the same position all their lives, and if you were to take multiple measurements of the same individual spider, you'd end up with different dimensions each time. Thankfully, there are more reliable ways to measure a spider, although they don't yield sizes that sound quite as impressive. The first is body length, generally measured from the front of the carapace to the rear of the opisthosoma. Appendages are typically but not always excluded, hence the omission of the chelicerae and spinnerets from the measurement. However, body length, while certainly more consistent than leg span, is not without its faults. Depending on how well fed and hydrated a spider is, or in the case of females, whether or not it is gravid, the size of the opisthosoma can vary tremendously even on the same individual. A well fed or gravid spider will have a larger opisthosoma and therefore greater body length than another spider of otherwise equal dimensions. That brings us to yet another measurement, carapace length and width. The carapace is a single sclerite. It's hard, rigid, and won't change dimensions regardless of whether or not the spider is gravid or well fed. Of all the means of measurement I've covered here, this is the most consistent, albeit the least impressive. So if your goal is to terrify your neighbours with stories of that huge huntsman on your windscreen or whatever, that was definitely the size of a dinner plate, yeah, definitely, then you might want to go by leg span. So that is the end of this video, the second episode of A Guide to Australian Spiders. In the next episode, I'll be taking a look at the major groupings of spiders and how they relate to one another. If you enjoy my content, then feel free to subscribe, check out some of my other uploads, and let me know what you thought in the comments section too. Thank you very much for watching, that is it from me, and I shall see you again very soon.